I want to bring us together this morning with our call to worship. It is a call and response. We are justice making, truth seeking people. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. Come, let us worship together. This morning at BUC, we're experiencing a lot of feelings. Some reconnection, some consternation, anxiety, open-heartedness, hope, frustration and sadness, you name it. And for the BUC Chalice Choir, when we are feeling this way, we will often begin our rehearsals with, there's more love somewhere. So if you will join me, please remain seated. This is hymn number 95 if you want to look it up, but it's easy to learn if you don't already know it. There's more love somewhere, there's more hope somewhere, there's more peace somewhere. In our BUC world and in the world community. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. <laughs> it is good to be together again. Whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary remotely via Zoom or watching this recording later, it is good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in person. First, we will project the image of folks who are currently on Zoom up here on the screen and ask them to turn their cameras on and give us a wave. And now, <laughs> Now, we who are gathered in person will turn to face the camera at the back of the room and give them a wave. <laughs> Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC. At home, on campus, in the world, every day, we are Birmingham Unitarian Church and we are building the beloved community. We join with other Unitarian Universalists around the world as we light our chalice with these words by Jennifer Leota Gray. We come together every week, bound not by a creed 
or a mutual desire to please one God or many gods. Yet we are drawn together by a belief that how we are in the world, who we are, matters. We light this chalice together in the knowledge that love, not fear, can change the world. And now will you rise in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number 391, Voice Still and Small. We welcome Kenea Denae Perkins as our guest in the pulpit today. She is a UU ministerial aspirant and a student at Star King School for the Ministry. This summer, she started as a resident for the Mid-America region. Her approach to community development centers including, include community capacity building, principled conflict resolution, and advocating for system change that is rooted in relationships and connections. Her sermon theme is ritual as a tool for liberation. In this reflection, Kanea Dene will weave her personal learnings and practices of ritual sharing, how they have had a profound impact on her seminary and journey. I think I made things goofy. I changed the order of some things, but I think where we are in our moment is the children. Yes, we are going to watch an amazing book on tape called Fry Bread. And if you have ever eaten fry bread, you're going to get your mouth's going to get all salivated. But if you've never had it, you're going to want to take down the recipe at the end of the book so that you can go home and make some. So please enjoy Thank fry you. bread. Thank you, Kiana um, Danae. Yeah. <laughs> and then, we'll, then uh, this is a part of our time for all ages. And then after that, we will sing the children out as you all traditionally and standardly do. So fry bread. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erica with the Atlanta Community Food Bank. I'm here to read a story with you today. The name of the book is Fry Bread, a Native American family story written by Kevin Noble Mallard, illustrated by Juana Martinez Neal. Fry bread is food, flour, salt, water, cornmeal, baking powder, perhaps milk, maybe sugar, all mixed together in a big bowl. Fry bread is shaped, hands mold the dough, flat like a pancake, 
round like a ball, or puffy like Nana's softest pillow. Fry bread is sound. The skillet clangs on the stove. The fire blazes from below. Drop the dough in the skillet. The bubbles sizzle and pop. Fry bread is color, golden brown, tan or yellow, deep like coffee, sienna or earth, light like snow and cream, warm like rays of sun. Fry bread is flavor. See beans or soup, smell tacos, cheese, and vegetables, delight in honey and jam, rise to discover what brings us together. Fry bread is time. On weekdays, in holidays, supper or dinner, powwows and festivals, moments together with family and friends. Fry bread is art, sculpture, landscape, portrait, our daily craft, shared from teacher to student, a cycle of heritage and fortune. Fry bread is history, the long walk, the stolen land, strangers in our own world. With unknown food, we made new recipes from what we had. Fry bread is place, Alaska, Kansas, all the way to Maine, down to Delaware, on to Georgia, over to Oklahoma, Colorado, and California. Cities and lands we call home. Fry bread is nation, Abenaki, Apache, Arabaho, Ojibwe, Arananga, Agola Sioux, Narizante, Navajo, Nipnup, Seminole, Seshone, Sac and Fox, hundreds and hundreds of tribes. Fry bread is everything, round, flat, large, small, north, south, east, west, brown, yellow, black, white, familiar and foreign, old and new, we come together. Fry bread is us. We are still here, elder and young, friend and neighbor, we strengthen each other to learn, change, and survive. Fry bread is you. Be sure to check out the end of the book where you can find a recipe for fry bread and more information about Native American history and culture. Thanks for joining me today. You can find other stories read by fellow food bankers on our YouTube page. Thank you. Are there religious ed teachers in the congregation this morning? So we will sing our children out now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so children of all ages who choose to go to religious ed, please go. You shall go out in joy, for you shall go out in joy, and come back in peace, and come back shall go out in joy and come back in peace and come back in peace blessed be mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offerings to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. 
This month's plate collection, the Michigan Urban Farming Initiative, uses urban agriculture as a way to promote education, sustainability, and community by empowering people living in urban settings, solving many social problems facing Detroit, and developing a model for other urban communities. The three-acre farm donates all the food it produces, most directly to people in the neighborhood and the rest to food pantries. Michigan Urban Farming Initiative and far primary focus is the redevelopment of a three-acre area in Detroit's North End, which is being positioned as an epicenter of urban agriculture. They are hoping to demonstrate everything from best practices for sustainable urban agriculture, effective strategies for increasing food security, cost-competitive and scalable models for blight, deconstruction and innovation in blue and green infrastructures. 200 people volunteer at the organization each week and thousands of pounds of organically grown produce is given to households near its Brush Street location. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This op offering will now be received with gratitude. Ushers, please come forward. Sorry, I rushed you. <laughs> I haven't done this for a couple of years, so I'm <laughs> practicing. 
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We come now to the time in our service set aside for spiritual practices. New this year, we are including an embodied practice. Research indicates that the pressure and stress of the past several years has had an impact on our bodies and on our behavior. We have faced a lot of trauma and accelerated levels of change without enough opportunity to process or integrate what we've experienced. We've added this element to our worship services in an effort to use mind-body integration practices to help us feel centered and grounded. Today's practice is our sun response that we use to mark the close of our spiritual practice. Song is breath, and the words give form to our meditation. When we come to that time in the service after memorial candles, if you wish, Place your hands on opposite shoulders and hug yourself as we sing. This is a time in our service where we lift up our joys and concerns. I don't see any. Nope, none today. Okay. News of life-shaping events that bring us great joy or sorrow. Here in this space we gather, called by our sense of urgency, or duty, or the longing for community called to be together on this day. Here in this space, we are gathered, called to do our part in weaving a web of human community. Here in this space, we gather to share our joys and sorrows. And I have one joy or sorrow, I'm sorry. Larry Larson writes that he really misses Maurice Lufford who died recently at the age of 92. Maurice was so helpful in the discussion groups and had such a great sense of humor. And I do remember that with his British accent. So it was lovely. On the fourth Sunday of every month, we light candles to remember those who have died in that month, in any year. You are welcome to light a candle for anyone that you're remembering this day or if a concern in your heart. As you light your candle, <clears throat> you are invited to say the name of who you remember or any concern you have. You are invited to come forward on your own time using the aisle closest to the choir. Please remember to place your lighted candles as far back in the candle holder. We begin by lighting a candle from our chalice for the ones who are remembered by those who have joined us on Zoom.
as a way to seal our joys, sorrows, and our memorials. I ask us to take a deep breath, to remember all of the candles that are lit, all of the words that are still in our hearts, that are lingering between all of us and are connected with. Let they rest in our hands, let they find space in our heads, and let they find peace in our hearts. Let us continue with our spiritual practices. Many writers have reflected on the role of ritual, how we create, embrace, and give it meaning. Here are two writers. Michael Mead is a renowned storyteller, author, and scholar of mythology, anthropology, and psychology, most of the ologies. He is the founder of the Mosaic Multicultural Foundation. This is what he says about ritual. One purpose of creative ritual was to experience the connection to the other, as well as a deeper connection to oneself. That's why ancient people would say, that ritual made me more aware of how I'm connected to life, to the earth, to the spirits, to the song of creation, and made me aware of who I am inside at the level of my own being. What we've lost is partly the sense that we are each connected to the whole thing, that each human soul is secretly connected to the living soul of the world. Alison Lee Lilly, an author, poet, and painter, experiments in both word and image, delving into the interplay of aesthetics, theology, ecology, and ritual. When we light a candle in our ritual space, we ignite a flame within ourselves. When we pour water, or burn incense as offerings, we offer ourselves as well to soak into the earth or rise in gentle wisps of smoke towards the sky. Ritual is not simply an attitude or intention, just as love is not simply a feeling. As its most basic, ritual is something that you do. A man can't plow a field just by thinking about it. He must go out to the field and get to work. Yet, if he is fully present to the work and the acts with mindfulness and loving attention, that is, if he brings his whole self along, then even as he turns over the rich soil beneath his plow, he turns it over in his mind and heart as well. The act of tilling the soil becomes an act of tilling the soul. The choir's anthem this morning is very much a ritualized piece of choral music throughout all of the UU culture in our country and in the United Kingdom. This is a John Rutter piece I'm sure many of you have heard before, sung for you this morning by the BUC Chalice Choir. Thank you. 
It would be, uh, good morning. <laughs> um, we're gonna do one more embodied practice. Um, one of the things I've learned about myself in seminary is that I need space before I preach. So I get to invite you all, our journey of, um, of sermonating or being in sermon starts now. But we're gonna start it with a little more embodied practice. I'm going to read some words from Gwen Matthews, a piece called Feel That. And then we're going to sit in a comfortable, okay silence for about two minutes. And then I'll take us on the next part of the journey. Um, find a way to sit that feels comfortable. I just did something I told myself I wasn't gonna do and I did it anyway. I took off my shoes. <laughs> I said get comfortable, I took that to heart. These words are from Gwen Matthews. Find a place in your body, whether you're on screen or in the uh, sanctuary, that feels comfortable, that you can hold for about two to three minutes. Feel that. A, porson, a person's torso and arms. They are holding out their forearm and hand, palm up in a gesture of acceptance and receiving. Feel that. Each breath, every inhale, and exhale. We are living, breathing, connected. We are the whole, complete, our beautiful selves that we were born to be. Feel that. In your bones, in your muscles, in your heart and your blood, that this is the extraordinary you the you you were born for this time, for this place, and this moment. Feel that. The struggle, the worry, the pain, the loss, the grief, it is still you. You are still whole, complete, beautiful, extraordinary. Feel that. Come back with us. Before I begin, I need to do one small personal ritual, and that is that I need to call my comrades, elders, and ancestors into this space, making it holy and making it a temporary home. I want to offer an orientation to today's message. I wrote this at a unique intersection in my life. There are streams of thoughts here that are poetic and melodic, and there are streams that speak to a seminarian trying to bridge personal reflection and the art of sermonating. Today, you're going to hear all of that, but we will end our time together by weaving all of these knowings. So let this part of our journey begin. I stand on the banks of a small tributary stream at a local botanical garden, Mathau, in Ann Arbor if you know it. From here, I survey the water's edge, noticing all of the new green and low-hung bushes that have fallen, there's trees that have fallen over the winter and they are strewn across the banks like abandoned toys in a child's room. But there is a calm here. And that's when I heard a softness that only comes in one frequency, 
my small, still voice. Now let's hold that moment. It's not going anywhere, and I also think you and the moment are worthy of some context setting. So let's take a practical detour. As a minister in training, I often think about what makes me spiritual. What actions or practices ground my faith, and ritual is high on that list. And it seemed like a great topic for a sermon, so I started researching. I looked at books and websites, and I got out my journals, and I wrote, and it wasn't long before I was consumed with the concept of ritual. But then I did what I do best. I stopped. I paused. I took a deep breath. The topic became heavy and I was struggling, having a hard time translating my thoughts into a sermon. And although I love some prose expression, I know that there is benefit in applying a more scientific approach to writing, so I got out my academic keyboard. First, I wanted to make sure that my definition of ritual was fresh in my mind. Webster offered this really stale definition that lacked the nuance of everyday life. So here's the definition I want to offer of ritual. Ritual, the manner in which an action is carried out with the intention to create, nurture, and support, or otherwise assist in understanding of self, of the interconnected web, and to facilitate meaning making. Given the definition, I begin to consider, what about rote rituals? What are rote rituals? Well. I find daily tasks like brushing my teeth or making coffee pretty rote. For me, rote rituals allow one part of my brain to be in low engagement while the other parts are in high engagement. And at times, I find a lot of comfort in rote behaviors. I love going downstairs and seeing my water and my coffee and my pot and everything's where it's supposed to be. Um, however, from a practical perspective, it could be dangerous to be in constant autopilot state. We have to ground. We have to have physical touch with other people and be active participants in our own survival. My limited and very unscientific research about rote rituals observed that rote rituals don't shift or change my relationship with my still small voice. If anything, it creates more space for me to be present to my small voice. So, if brushing my teeth, what's, uh, uh. next I started to think about activities that I do that hold the space between rote ritual and deep meaning ritual. This kind of swath that we'll call micro rituals. I was thinking about activities like swimming and fiber arts, and it was not long before I was consumed with thoughts about micro rituals, but I did what I do best. I stopped, I paused, and I took a breath. This sermon is not the best place to unpack micro rituals. It is a huge piece of territory that could consume the rest of our time together. And I don't know about you, but I want to get back to the garden. Carl Sagan. Um, placing a pin here for future sermon ideas, macro rituals matter. That means that we arrive at deep spiritual meaning making our macro rituals. These are behaviors that create a direct, not passive, conversation with my small voice. These are times when I am seeking brave conversations between myself and my small, still voice. I open the door to spirit with activities like singing, reading a sacred text, praying, meditating, crying, laughing, dancing, breathing. My faith is lived and embodied. I call on the goddess with every part of me. This is the polar opposite of rote or habit. This is a deep and tender, magical place. At times, the connection between myself and my small, still voice grows strained. And in those tenuous times, I seek a radical change in how I am moving with my God self. I go to her altar humble and teachable. I am open to the lessons and grace she has to offer, and in this way, ritual becomes a tool for spiritual repair. Having done a thorough examination of 
personal ritual. I then shifted to my attention to faith-based rituals. I am a minister, right? But I realized here too, we needed a definition of communal ritual. The manner in which a group's actions are carried out with the intention to create, nurture, support, or otherwise assist in understanding ourselves in the context of the group, in the context of the interconnected web that is the group and facilitate collective meaning making. How am I here, here, here? For many communal worship, celebrations of life, time at a meeting house, mosque, temple, chapel, fellowship, all of those places are spiritual home bases. It is the one place where folks allow themselves to be spiritually vulnerable. Being a member of a faith community serves to tie a knot at the end of the interconnected web, giving us a place to hold on in times of spiritual need. We come into these rooms to celebrate the joys of this life. In this sacred space, we held each other during births and graduations, weddings, adoptions, coming out, new jobs, the loss of jobs, home ownership, divorce, war, and deaths. At any given time, we as a humanity and as individuals are holding so much unspoken tenderness in our hearts. And we come here to surrender that heaviness. We come into these rooms to engage in the process of personal fire tending and liberatory fire sharing. My understanding of the Unitarian Universalist values, principles, covenant compels me to work toward collective liberation. For me, that means I engage in the communal tasks that support a healthy community. Our faith, our denomination, this building, this church, this city, this region are all a multi-layered, intricate system. We are impacted by and we impact systems. We cannot be singular as it pertains to politics, faith, government, family rights, individual rights. My queer siblings are not singular. My individual, my, I'm sorry, indigenous siblings are not singular. My siblings seeking access to reproductive care are not singular. My black kin folks who simply want to exist are not singular. Saint Audre Lorde remind us that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. We cannot extract collective liberation when we are focused on the singular. We have to see the expansiveness first of self, then of others and apply it to the whole. As a minister in training, I would be remiss not to mention our UU specific rituals. UU's theology base doesn't mandate holy days. However, we have created some binding and unique rituals to the UU liturgical experience. In most UU gathering spaces, you are likely to experience the lighting of a chalice and the reading of a covenant. Seasonally, we use water communion in the fall and flower communion in the late spring as bookends to open and close our nine month worship cycle. There are other dates of importance in many UU communities, including seasonal celebrations of Halloween, Christmas, Easter, and the equinoxes. And we are also mindful of culturally specific events such as Kwanzaa, Juneteenth, Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month, Indigenous Land Acknowledgement, Queer Pride, and Trans Day of Visibility. It matters to me on a personal and spiritual level that we have a variety of ways to be in conversation with our good self or our still small voice. We need community. It helps shape and inform who we are and how we relate to the larger culture. We need faith homes that nurture us into our best selves. Whew, that's a lot of thinking. But what, but, but what does it all mean? What does all of this mean? And I think this is when we head back to the garden. And here is where we change over to the prose keyboard and we invite more fact and less and lots more whimsy. 
To recall, I am standing on the banks of a small tributary stream at a local botanical garden. I, I wasn't there by chance. Nature walks are one of my micro rituals. It's how I stay in touch with my God self. Have you ever just, is, this isn't scripted, but I want to say this out loud. Uh, I had this project for school where I had to be off screen for three hours. What a, just a joy. And sarcasm and seriousness. Because what I got to hear were the leaves coming through the trees. And I got to hear the sound of leaves and gravel under my feet in a way that when I'm listening to music, that when I'm making my grocery list, that when I'm thinking about when's the next time my oil change is supposed to happen, if I'm thinking about if that Amazon package arrives, that I don't hear. But I took off that screen and I took away that other noise and I was able to hear a sound that I wanna now never not hear. I wanna hear the sound of leaves and gravel under my feet. I'm hungry for it now. So uh, I was in that garden and I arrive on the banks of the stream tired and overwhelmed with the task of synthesizing what I know of ritual into a sermon that prepared the community for the week ahead. And then I heard a softness that only comes in one frequency, my small still voice. My hearing felt sharp. The air in my lungs felt crisp. My vision felt clear and my awareness was focused and relaxed all at the same time. And so I knew it was time to do what I know how to do best. I paused and I took a breath. And several truths hit me all at once. And here's the meat of the lesson I want to leave, leave with you today. Or mushroom, I don't, vegetarians, I'm here for you. <laughs> In the babble and the gurgles, I heard a dialogue between the river and the rock. A chat wherein they openly expressed admiration and appreciation for each other. They were not in competition, nor were they fighting for power or this wasn't performative allyship. They were moving in a way that affirmed their individual and collective thriving, a mutually beneficial dynamic dynamic, focused on getting the most needs met. The river helps form and shape the rock, while the rock helps guide the water on its way. I need ritual to form and shape me, and ritual helps guide me on my way. Ritual is the liminal space where, both, where we are both boundaried and adaptable. For example, the rock does not change its material composition, it's boundaried. And it also accepts that over time it will be changed by virtue of being in relationship to the water, it's adaptable. I am a black woman. I cannot change my material composition. I am boundaried. I am magic. And over time, I will change the world by virtue of the spells I cast, the community I keep, and the rituals I host. I am adaptable. Our faith is lived and embodied. This requires that we have an active and engaged conversation with our God self, good self, small, still voice, and an active way to be in connection with beloved community. Many of us, myself included, are painfully passive in our spiritual practices. I know I arrived Sunday morning speaking, seeking to have a transformative spiritual experience by simply being in the room, as if proximity was a binding agent of faith, as if putting flour next to sugar makes cookies. We know that that's not how it works. And for me, some of the strongest binding agents of faith are intention, action, and grace. In the listening, I was told, rituals are the space where I can say, humanity, I am lost. And humanity can say, dear heart, I miss you. 
come home. And here in this sacred space, in that sacred moment, I was told this truth. Breathing is the first ritual and first ceremony. We have all participated. We have all in our own ways been witnesses of the cycle of breath and the cycle of life. Breathing lives in a continuum. Rise, rising, risen, rose. This is how we come to know that grace, too, lives on a continuum. Grace, graceful, grace-filled, and graced. Everything, my friends, lives on a continuum of breath. Everything lives on a continuum of grace. That is ritual. Friends, as you prepare for the week ahead, I hope that you find ways to engage in rituals that affirm you, that you find ways to be in loving conversation with yourself and your small, still voice. May we continue to be held in sacred spaces on the continuum of grace and breath, breath and grace, grace and breath. Ashe and amen, my friends. Ashe and amen. Well, we're going to close our, our service today. I've invited Tom up here to help me s help lead you with this hymn because it's got two parts in it, and he didn't know I was going to ask him to do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Will you please rise in body and spirit and join in singing this jubilant hymn? Thank you so much, almost Reverend Kiana Dene, for being with us this morning. Now let us sing. So there's kind of a low part that Tom's going to be responsible for, and he's going to lead you in. So if you feel like rumbling down in the basement, please join with Tom. And then a, a little mid, mid or, or higher part, if you feel like letting it rip a little bit, you'll just join me. All right? So here we go. Whenever you're ready. So we get to close this party down, me and Judy, together. Yes, we are. <laughs> so I'm going to offer some words, and then Judy's going to give you all the, the other part of the sandwich. <sighs> May you be changed. May you leave this time together changed. May the promise you have made to yourself about who you want to be feel closer to reality than who you are right now. May you share that feeling of transformation wherever you go. May it spread in every word, deed, thought, and interaction until we are all changed, transformed, and transforming together, becoming our best selves. Go now into the world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love. 
go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. <laughs>